Welcome to Clinical Minute. Janet is a 46-year-old woman who comes to see you for a routine checkup. She tells you she would like to stop taking the pill and wants to talk about other kinds of contraception. She tells you she got divorced since she saw you last year, and with two teenage sons to raise on her own, she doesn't plan to date much in the coming year. She wants to consider contraceptive options that she can control and use only as needed. You ask her about her experience with other kinds of contraceptives. Janet tells you she used the diaphragm when she was younger and that she felt comfortable with it, she explains that she doesn't want anything that involves hormones, even small amounts. She doesn't feel she will need contraception very often for at least the next several months. You tell her that you understand and respect her rationale, but want to be sure that she understands that ruling out all of the hormonal methods, the vaginal ring, the two hormonal IUDs, the pill, patch, and injections, would also rule out all but one of the methods considered to be the most effective at preventing pregnancy. You clarify whether she has any questions about specific risks of hormones or hormonal methods, or if perhaps she might wish to consider a non-hormonal IUD, the copper T, which might be a convenient and effective way to meet her goal. But Janet shakes her head. She tells you no, she really prefers to use an as-needed method now, and that she will return if she begins having intercourse more frequently than she is anticipating. You ask whether she has considered other types of barrier methods, such as a female condom or a cervical cap. Janet tells you she doesn't know much about those. She also wonders whether the cervical cap and female condom might be more complicated or difficult to insert than the diaphragm. You tell Janet you will give her a chance to see a sample of each of the three barrier methods and that she'll have an opportunity to ask more questions about each one. You pull out a model to demonstrate the placement of the diaphragm, a female condom, and the cervical cap. You ask Janet which one would she like to discuss first. She responds that she has never actually seen a female condom before and wants to examine it. You give her the female condom, show her how it is inserted using the model. She asks you how it would feel to a partner. You tell her that men often say they have less decrease in sensation with the female condom compared with the male version. What about me, she asks, pointing out that it seems awfully big. You tell her that there aren't a lot of fine sensation nerve endings in the vaginal walls, unlike the head of the penis, so many women are very comfortable using the female condom, but that its use is a highly personal preference. You explain that the female condom does offer a special advantage in reducing risk of transmitting HIV and other viral infections between partners because it covers some of the external female genitalia. And you also explain, because it is made of polyurethane instead of latex, the female condom is about 40% stronger than a male condom and less likely to break, although breakage is an infrequent event with proper use of either condom. Janet frowns a bit and then tells you that she is not sure she would feel comfortable using something that covers her outsides. You turn to the cervical cap and hand it to Janet to feel. She tells you it looks a lot like a small version of a diaphragm. You tell her it is a silicone rubber cap that she would position directly onto her cervix. It works on the same principle as the diaphragm, you explain, by blocking the sperm's entry to the uterus but is much smaller because it fits directly on the cervix, using a little bit of suction to keep it in place. You advise Janet that, like the diaphragm, it is most effective when used in conjunction with a spermicide cream or jelly. You take it from her and demonstrate how it sits on the cervix. You explain she would leave it in place for at least six hours after intercourse, but should not exceed 48 hours to avoid the risk of infection like toxic shock, a very rare but serious complication. She looks puzzled, and you explain that certain bacteria that live in the vagina in small numbers without harm can multiply and cause a serious infection if vaginal or cervical tissues are deprived of oxygen for a long time. Just as with tampons, removing the cervical cap or diaphragm within the recommended time frame will allow for airflow and for natural secretions to cleanse the tissues, reducing the risk that these bacteria would multiply and cause toxic shock. 
She asks about advantages and disadvantages. You explain that some women like the cervical cap because its small size makes it easier to carry unobtrusively in a pocket or purse. However, the need to place the smaller cap directly onto the cervix itself makes it a little more difficult for some women to insert than a diaphragm, and it can sometimes be pushed out of place by the penis with heavy thrusting or certain sexual positions, so we recommend checking that it's in place over the cervix after intercourse. Some women experience vaginal irritation with its use, but if the problem is mild, then the reaction may be to the spermicide being used. If that were to happen, you would advise her to try a different brand of spermicide to see if that clears up the problem. You also tell her that it is rare, but occasionally some women do feel pain or discomfort with the use of a cervical cap. You explain that sizing is based on her obstetric history, doesn't require an exam or change with body weight, and typically, once in place, neither device can be felt by either a woman or her partner. You then pick up the diaphragm and explain that, as she probably remembers, it is a flexible silicone or latex dome-shaped cup that she would insert into her vagina, making sure to cover her cervix. The diaphragm is larger because it is designed to fit, front to back, the entire roof of the vagina, making it easier to insert, but less specific. As with a cervical cap, it is meant to be used with spermicidal cream or jelly, both initially and with any subsequent intercourse while it is still in place. You tell her that just as with the cervical cap, she can insert the diaphragm up to six hours ahead of time without needing to add any more spermicide, so there is no need to interrupt sex play. A diaphragm can also be dislodged during sex, but this is uncommon with either the cap or the diaphragm. You recommend she should leave it in place for at least six hours after intercourse, but should remove it within 24 hours. If she has intercourse again, or has intercourse more than six hours after she puts the diaphragm in, she should leave the diaphragm in place and insert more spermicide deep into the vagina after intercourse. It carries the same, extremely rare, risk of toxic shock syndrome as does a cervical cap. You explain that both diaphragms and cervical caps come in different sizes and types, and depending on her choice, you will fit her with the proper size for her and give her a prescription. Typically, the cost is low, with caps costing less than $80 and less for diaphragms, and with proper care, they should last for at least a year. Proper care includes washing it in warm water and air drying it after use and keeping it in a cool, dry place. She should be refitted with any weight change greater than 10 to 15 pounds and after childbirth. You also remind her that neither the cervical cap nor a diaphragm protects against sexually transmitted diseases. Neither one should be used during her menstrual cycle. Janet asks how likely she is to get pregnant again if she uses any of these properly. You tell her that out of 100 nulliparous women using the cervical cap, 14 pregnancies will occur and 29 pregnancies out of 100 Paris women will occur per year. You further explain that out of 100 women using the diaphragm, 12 pregnancies will occur per year, which is about equally effective and probably better than the female condom in typical use. However, you explain, your individual success will really depend on whether you insert it properly and follow the directions carefully each time you use it. Janet decides she would like to try a cervical cap. You explain it in more detail, find the right size for her, and show her how to place it properly. You give her the opportunity to insert it a few times herself, checking that she has placed it properly. You tell her to call or return for a visit if she experiences pain or burning with urination, irregular spotting or bleeding, discomfort during sex or afterwards while using the cap, any irritation or itch that doesn't resolve with a change of spermicide, or any unusual discharge. Janet is pleased with this option, and leaves with a prescription and a reminder to return in a year.